right. Okay, guys, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, this obviously is the social mobile track, um, and you guys are clearly the survivors of the various drinking festivities. And yes, if you were at the party, it was me doing the silly breakdancing stuff. I apologize for that. Okay, so what we're going to do today is talk about the state of play in the mobile industry, in particular with social games. And um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Oscar Clark. I'm the developer evangelist for Papaya. Um, and uh, today I've got the pleasure of introducing one of our fiercest competitors, um, but also a, a great guy who has a huge level of experience in what happens with social games and mobile games. And Ethan here from uh, Gree um, has been at the heart of what's happening in innovation here. So what I'm going to do is just pass you straight over to him, let him do all the talking from now on. But uh, please, um, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, feel free to talk to us, but raise your hand, come up to the mic and talk to us. Or if you're feeling a bit shy, don't have any problem tweeting. If you want to tweet hash casual connect, I'll try and keep track of them and make sure that we ask as many of those questions as we can. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ethan. Hello. Ah. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's the first track of the morning. And uh, I guess there was a pretty good party last night, which I missed. My flight was late, uh, so I ended up getting in around 12.30. Um, but it uh, sounds like it was a good time. Uh, my name is Ethan Fassett. I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, Product for GRI International, which is the US division of GRI Japan. Um, Gree International is also a um, recently merged entity with OpenFaint, which is uh, also a, a, a well-known mobile social gaming platform. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, the relationship between social games and platforms. Uh, the presentation will cover the nature of sort of platforms, how platforms work to sustain social games. Uh, then I want to take a look at uh, two examples of how platforms have operated in the market uh, to date. One, uh, looking at Facebook and Zynga uh, in the PC space, and then also touch on how GRI has developed itself in the Japan market. And then from there, we'll make some speculations about the current state of the global mobile uh, social platform market uh, and take it from there. So. Here we are. So as I said, um, GRI, just a quick overview of the company. Um, so GRI was uh, actually founded in 2004 in Japan by Yoshikazu Tanaka. Uh, GRI International uh, started last year in San Francisco as the US division for GRI, started by Naoki Aoyagi, uh, who um, also now runs both OpenFaint and GRI, which as I mentioned before are merged entities. Um, OpenFaint, for those of you who um, don't know OpenFaint, um, long-time uh, mobile social gaming platform, uh, has about 150 million users worldwide. Um, and as of late, um, excuse me, both GRI and OpenFaint uh, have been working to produce a, a merged common platform, so taking the two businesses together and creating a common social gaming platform. Um, some quick... Um, uh, summary of, of GRI's financials. Uh, GRI is a public company, uh, so all of this information is disclosed and available. Um, GRI uh, is a, a top performer within the Japan market, um, particularly in the last year, has seen uh, fantastic financial growth in large part due to its ability to operate its platform in conjunction with its games business. Um, just to put things in perspective, uh, the third quarter profits for GRI of this year uh, actually exceeded Zynga's uh, third quarter profits by approximately 100 million. Um, also, it did so at 50% profit margins, whereas Zynga's operating profit is just above 10%. Uh, it also did so on approximately one third of the users that Zynga is monetizing. So, uh, Gree's market is certainly lucrative, but Gree also brings a lot of operational experience that has proven itself out in financial performance. Uh, with the merged entity of OpenFaint and GRI, it has a very strong global footprint um, in uh, the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Uh, I come from the San Francisco office. 
Um, in terms of user base, the combined entities are approximately 100 million, 190 million registered users, which would make it the largest mobile social gaming platform uh, in the world today. And approximately 7,500 uh, games are supported on this platform. So um, let's discuss uh, the platform. Uh, and uh, again, I just want to kind of take a general approach. And, and before I go uh, too far into this, I just wanted to poll the audience to get a sense of um, sort of what people's base knowledge is. Um, so how many people here are actually game developers? Okay, and of, or you, you can keep your hands up. Of, of everyone who is a game developer, who is developing on mobile? Okay, and social mobile? Okay, all right, okay. Okay, um, I will try and go through these slides um, quick enough that we'll have a good Q&A afterwards, um, but we'll just go through some general uh, topics here. So, um, Let's first talk about free to play or freemium, uh, which is sort of a superset of what social games are. Freemium is one of those jargony contractions, which means free and premium, and basically refers to uh, removing the uh, download price of, of your game, whether it's mobile or otherwise, and then trying to funnel the user into purchasing at a later point in time. Uh, there's a bunch of different techniques for doing this. Uh, so it's a very broad category. And so you should think of social as a specific subcategory of freemium. Um, quick point here is just why freemium is so attractive. This maybe goes without saying, but point being, uh, with a premium download, you very quickly reach uh, a maximum revenue, whereas with freemium, if you're able to successfully re-engage your audience, you monetize several times over. You're able to tune monetization points within the game. Uh, you're able to optimize monetization long term. Uh, for those of you, uh, and as many of you who are game developers, you know that your audience changes over time. Your early users are generally more lucrative. Your later users are a little more difficult to engage. Um, so having that flexibility in the pricing model means that you optimize revenue over time. Um, this trend has uh, definitely seen itself borne out uh, in the mobile space. The majority of the top downloaded games these days are using uh, freemium pricing models. Um, very few, the uh, boxed items here are, are noted as freemium games right now. Uh, so you can, this is the gen, more, more trending information here on, on um, freemium games within the Apple App Store. Um, so some, some basic mechanics for uh, freemium games uh, is trying to maintain an overall lifetime value calculation for your users. So lifetime value is commonly used, all kinds of products and industries. It's calculated in many different ways. Effectively, what we're talking about is how much revenue you're making for all of your users based on how engaged those users are, whether or not you're able to retain them over time and then you have to um, take away the cost of actually acquiring those users. So how much did it cost in marketing to acquire those users? Um, freemium is all about tuning the lifetime value of your user. The cost per acquisition, very straightforward. Uh, you have to spend on ads, you have to spend on marketing. Um, this gives you uh, all of your reach, you divide that by your number of users and that gets you how much it costs to acquire each individual user. So to tie this back to social then, uh, what building games on a social platform allows you to do is uh, provides very, very specific techniques and channels to very efficiently tune the various aspects of the LTV calculation. So this is a very reductionist way of looking at gameplay, but in simple mechanics, what you're talking about is trying to distend player engagement, try to lessen the cost of acquiring a new user so that you're able to up your margins. Um, so some very basic points about a social network. Uh, notifications, for example, you use to drive engagement. You use gifting techniques, things like that, that re-engage or awaken users that may have gone dormant. Um, if you have like a, an activity feed in the network that you're pinging, then you should also see a halo effect of other users observing that player behavior. They awaken. Using things like request system um, to, uh, to request friends to join games uh, is potentially free acquisition, assuming that the social platform actually provides these things. Both of these things then increase uh, LTV. 
So that, that's fairly straightforward. But the, the point is, and it bears saying, is that the social network provides all of these things and the platform provides all of these things at exceedingly low cost. Otherwise, what ends up happening is the game developer has to seek these same channels and these same methods on external channels, um, which adds friction, adds management cost, adds overhead. Uh, and this is why there, this is why in specific on the mobile case, um, you could argue that there's a ceiling on growth for existing social freemium games without any kind of predominant platform that's able to provide these channels at the same efficiency. So <clears throat> to look just at, at um, say, how things work on PC, this is all straightforward, but the users are all aggregated within the social network. They discover the games sometimes happenstance, but basically because they're being pinged by their friends within the social network. Um, in mobile, um, very often what happens is in the way that, that most of these platforms are developed is that they're built within an SDK, which the developer implements within their games. So the user actually discovers the social network while playing the game. So from a usability standpoint, uh, that, prevents some, that, that, that presents some uh, friction for the user to uh, discover the social network, to re-engage with the social network. Um, but nonetheless, that's, that's usually how the, the network itself is introduced. And then that's augmented with like a standalone application as well. So the user at some point downloads a standalone application which also contains social network features. Um, but the bulk of the usage is tied within the game itself. So just to re-emphasize then, when, when you actually have this platform, on the acquisition side, uh, things like an app portal, as well as using uh, requests, um, speeds acquisition, lowers cost of acquisition, which otherwise you would have to get through ad networks. Um, in terms of retention, and this, I think this value is sometimes understated, but the ability to constantly ping the network, to be able to uh, reawaken users, bring them back into games, very easily publish content, any kind of sale you want to run, any kind of new uh, content extension you put on the game, new gameplay that's introduced, very, very cheap and effective way to tell your audience about what's happening. Also, if the platform is doing its job correctly, it's very, very easy for the user to get back into the game. Usually a, a link is directly sent within the game. There's very few friction points between when the user sees that message and when they can start playing. Um, on mobile, uh, there is a lot of fragmentation. So sometimes if a message is sent, through uh, SMS or through email, uh, context can be lost within those hyperlinks. Um, and so you may be able to send the user into the game, but you may not be able to send them within a specific point within the game. Um, but there's, there's other instances like this where uh, mobile prov provides or, or presents additional friction uh, in, in that, that general conversion flow. Uh, and then in terms of monetization, so, uh, obviously, a highly engaged user base monetizes better. You just get them back for more opportunities. You can promote monetization opportunities better. Um, another thing that platforms sometimes provide are, are universal currencies. Um, so universal currencies work well on, say, Facebook. Uh, they provide what's called liquidity, where you have uh, enough scale in the universal currency that new users entering into your game already carry some sort of balance in their account. Uh, they are more likely to spend that balance. You don't have to get them to start acquiring that currency. Um, also, a user who has been uh, introduced to spending and has become habituated to spending in one prior game carries those habits likely into your game as well. So you see network effects in terms of spending behaviors as well. So if the platform goes away, everything becomes more costly. Uh, costly in terms of direct dollars and costly in terms of management. Uh, in the acquisition uh, side, you, you end up having to deal with ad networks. Um, ad networks are um, spotty in terms of coverage, uh, as well as they vary greatly in terms of their conversion e efficacy. Most of the time, ad networks targeting systems are uh, very coarse in terms of the categories and the criteria that they use for targeting their audiences. They do not have refined targeting criteria around specific gameplay metrics. Who is likely to spend? Who likes this genre of game? These sorts of things. Uh, some specialty uh, networks that do specialize in installs within, uh, within the gaming industry are starting to develop this targeting technology. 
Um, it's still fairly nascent, and most of the networks that do provide this technology also have limited coverage. So there's constant trade-offs, and usually what you end up having to do is manage campaigns across multiple channels. Multiple campaign management uh, means that you're dealing with varying uh, cost per install rates, so you have, uh, you, you, you basically are not able to do cost dollar averaging on the uh, campaign performance. You also need to have a lot of people sit and watch these campaigns all the time. Um, if you are able to consolidate this in a common platform, it simplifies things greatly. It also should reduce cost. Um, there are natural cycles in a platform's lifetime that will affect cost per install. Uh, I think a mature platform, if you look at Facebook, CPI rates have gradually increased um, for varying reasons, but uh, at different stages within a platform's lifetime, um, it's, it's, you can actually be quite opportunistic in terms of purchasing, and arguably, even though uh, CPI rates might be increasing within uh, a given platform, it's probably still cheaper than maintaining campaigns um, uh, without one. Um, retention becomes also more difficult. You basically are trying to use channels like push notifications, email, SMS, things like that, um, general marketing promotion uh, on other sites where you know users to, ag to, uh, to uh, congregate. Um, but the, again, the, the return, the, the sort of the mapping the full conversion uh, back into your game becomes difficult. Sometimes, as I said earlier, you're not able to provide context. Tracking becomes difficult. On iOS, it's very, very difficult to try and track uh, a new install, for example. So actually noting when a new user comes into your network sometimes is difficult from that channel. Uh, when, it, when all of this activity is contained within a given platform, those sorts of metrics are more readily available. Um, and, and the flow, the, the overall conversion rate should be higher. Um, and then in terms of monetization, um, now, I don't mean to say that, that monetization can't be well-tuned within games that are not on platforms. In fact, I think what ends up happening is games become uh, hypersensitive to monetization and ARPU maintenance when they don't have uh, easy user acquisition and retention because your costs are so high. You need to actually have this margin. And usually you adopt strategies of trying to uh, have games that cater towards high engagement audiences. So just very quickly, looking at Gree Japan, Gree was a platform on a platform. Uh, started first with uh, carriers in Japan. Uh, Gree actually started as a social network um, very early in its stage, though, and actually uh, started developing mobile social games uh, very, very quickly. Um, it actually developed, we believe, the first mobile social game in the world, um, which uh, we'll, we'll give a quick uh, overview of. And then some other key inflection points within the business occur once when it goes public, but then also when it opens up its gaming platform for third parties. And this drives a lot more usage and basically creates volume within the network. Um, which is essential for platform success. Uh, so the first mobile social game that they launched was a fishing game. It's actually still active today. Um, it was designed basically to bring in a lot of users. It has a very popular theme, very widely sort of accepted theme, uh, very easy game mechanics, but still uh, it, was, it was well done, had very good retention, but was designed to bring in high DAU. Uh, looking quickly at, at Zynga, or, or rather moving over towards Zynga and Facebook. Um, so here in gray we see Facebook's DAU in orange, uh, Zynga. Um, really it's about this time that, that real like viral apps like, you know, Hot or Not, Poke, Super Poke, all that kind of stuff started coming up, amassing huge DAU and then just dumping them right away. And then really uh, early social games pick up here where they actually start holding and retaining audience and Zynga um, obviously goes into the forefront. What we note here is really, uh, and, and actually this, is, this has been publicly discussed all over the place, but that, that a lot of Zynga's growth was dependent upon Facebook's also inflection. But what's interesting is basically they've kind of tapped out on DAU, whereas Facebook continues to increase. So DAU in this instance could be an artifact of retention it could be an artifact of just total addressable audience within the Facebook audience. Um, it, is, it is actually still remarkable to see that they are maintaining this kind of retention, however. Looking at revenue then, um, so we see here again in, uh, in the shaded portions are the audiences. 
so again, maintaining constant DAU, but monetizing it like crazy. Um, so this is basically showing that, that revenue spike there, um, which is really testament, again, to probably very, very strong engagement. So uh, very recent, this, this is kind of a, a nice segue into platform monetization, but very recently there was a, a blog post that went around where people are now scrutinizing Zynga's financials uh, ever since their S1 filing. Um, is, has anybody seen this blog post where I, it was, uh, let's see, who was it that had done this? I, in any case, there was, there's, basically this person took a look at, at acquisition for, for Zynga. They saw that uh, Zynga goes from, uh, let's see, oh, I don't have the numbers listed. They went from 3 million to 3.4 million uh, over the course of uh, basically between almost about a half a year. And they had spent uh, four, what was it? What did they spend on it? It was, uh, hmm, we're missing the number here. Oh, I'm sorry, 120 million uh, to acquire that, that uh, incremental user base. So again, from three to 3.4 million. Uh, and so this, this blogger speculated that really the incremental 400,000 was what was acquired then, which they then said, they looked at this number, which the average spender on, on Zynga basically spending $150 for each new user. So they multiplied that by the incremental number of users, 400,000, uh, and basically said, oh, well, if that's the case then, their cost per acquisition was so high that in fact they're paying twice as much as they're getting back. Um, people, I think, are really quick to try and find an Achilles heel in Zynga right now. Um, another blogger then pops on and says, no, 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 actually, what this person uh, failed to take into account was actually that there's a high attrition rate in, in this user base. And part of the LTV calculation is also looking at uh, the attrition of users. And so, uh, in fact, he just guessed a 20% attrition rate. So if over that time period you look at the 3 million start point and you apply a 20% attrition rate, and after that six month period, you end up with 3.4 million. In fact, you ended up acquiring a little bit more than 400,000 users. You probably acquired closer to about a million users. And in fact, if you were to do that, you're probably getting a margin of around $30. So we don't know really what Zynga's retention rate is, uh, but I think it's very uh, safe to say that, that there is obviously an attrition that you have to factor into audience. Um, 20% is actually quite generous. I mean, I don't know if you guys uh, kind of have off the top of your heads what your own retention rates might be for your games, but generally they're quite drastic. But as you saw here, Zynga is able to maintain an audience quite well, although they, they very well might see you know, some basic cycling through of those users. So I think something like this scenario is probably more likely. It's an interesting debate, but the, the key point is that really the platform is probably what enables this kind of retention. And so without a platform, this attrition rate becomes much steeper, and in fact, you get much, much closer to um, a neutral or negative margin. So that's kind of a state of, of uh, Facebook as a platform, uh, a little bit about GRI and how it operates as a mobile social platform. Uh, let's take a look at kind of what's going on right now in uh, mobile today and, and where platforms might be emerging. Um, I would say that right now there is really no single uh, mobile social platform out there. Uh, Facebook is obviously a predominant social app, but it having developed a mobile gaming ecosystem has yet to be determined. Um, one, one point here on this slide is, is uh, there's, there's different strategies uh, when there is no platform. There's different strategies for trying to acquire users, retain users, based on gameplay. Just a quick contrast, even though these aren't mobile games, uh, it's just pretty clear contrast in terms of game design, but if you were to look at Cityville, which was really a high DAU game, uh, lower uh, percent paying user, here this is really about trying to acquire large DAU. Game developers, um, especially like the larger game studios right now, uh, who are not, who are basically in mobile, who are without a large platform, are trying to figure out strategies of either trying to acquire large users, maintain those and cross promote them, and or be able to create uh, high ARPDAO games where they have a, re a high retention user base, maybe not as high DAU, but they're able to hold on to it longer and they can monetize it a whole lot better. So if they can successively make those sorts of titles, that's still a good business for them. 
Um, the key is that without being able to have a larger ecosystem in which these users move in and out, uh, neither has the same scale that Facebook has seen or that Gree has seen. There are successful games that don't have platforms right now. Um, so Tiny Tower is definitely one of them. Uh, Tiny Tower monetizes quite well, has created a pretty good DAU. Um, so good that uh, Zynga has decided they want to make one too. Did anybody see that letter that uh, Nimblebit wrote to Zynga? That's pretty awesome. All right, uh, let's see. So what we have right now in the market is an, ish, an instance where we have very, very high cost per acquisition. Um, people are trying to game the app store. It's a lot like an SEO business these days. In fact, I don't know if anybody saw, uh, I think in the last two days, there's a lot of uh, speculation and uh, accusations around bot farms. Uh, so install bots, basically some large mobile social studios trying to use uh, companies that are running bots basically to generate high installs. This puts you up into the top rankings, which then gives you the organic lift, right? Burst campaigning. Um, you have a limited number of ad networks right now, limited cross promotion, very weak viral engagement. Most game developers that I talk to right now um, have some social, but really most of their games and the gates that they apply within their freemium designs uh, rely less so on, on friend gating. They have to use lower numbers, fewer choke points. Um, but they're, they're, the platform uh, race is definitely on. There's a lot of people in this. So this is my attempt at a two by two. <clears throat> the axes uh, going top to bottom are social networking focus and uh, left to right game focus. So uh, there's a little bit of fuzziness in here, so please allow me to kind of uh, walk through some of the definitions. So if we look at high SNS focus on the left side, we look at Facebook General and, and Google General. These are companies that are focused on social networking per se. They certainly do address gaming, but it is a subset of what their overall business is. Um, moving to the right, uh, well, let's, we'll save that one for last. Uh, going down below, we go to the OS platforms. Um, so these are uh, obviously uh, right now Apple and Android. Um, both of whom do want to support a gaming ecosystem, which we note uh, with Game Center, or excuse me, Game Channel right now, but uh, Game Center. Um, but again, they have diversified businesses and running an OS is at a different point within the overall ecosystem on mobile as well. Um, here we have Studio. So this is, this is basically studios, as I was saying earlier, who are trying to build games that are going to be high DAU. They want to try and acquire those, build multiple titles. Eventually you're able to kind of create a common uh, user registration, you try and build more and more common tools this way, and you, you organically grow out a platform. And then finally up here we have meta platforms. These are platforms that are trying to uh, provide both sort of a social network, social platform experience, but focused primarily on gaming. So that's the distinction between these two. Um, and so Gree places itself here, uh, DNA's mobile gay is here. Um, and Apple, uh, we've also noted. And, and there are others coming as well. But this is one way to look at the platform. And, and, and the thing is, these are all trying to coexist right now. Um, all of these guys have to contend with the OS platform. So their terms of service are actually, uh, they present a lot of problems, a lot of barriers towards developing truly effective platforms. So the inability to fungibly exchange virtual assets across games, create a virtual currency, these sorts of things are inhibiting on Apple. Uh, Android less so, but we don't know how they'll want to regulate uh, going forward. Uh, but we, there's, there's basically a lot of, of dynamics here that are not yet resolved. And so the market is not settled yet. And really what we need to find is an offering that is able to address probably some of these friction points here um, but really build, uh, in Gree's opinion, a highly game-targeted platform environment that will aggregate gaming users that will be of higher quality. If you were to look just quickly back here, here you see really a lot of DAU that's just not interested in gaming. And so by focusing on gaming, you're probably able to engage that audience a lot more. So um, this kind of states what I really just, just went through here, so we're going to spend a, a great deal of time on this, but basically this is just sort of looking at some of the dimensions that we consider um, when we affect our strategy. So as I mentioned earlier, what we're trying to do right now is take what 
GRI has developed in Japan very, very highly efficient operations in, in running platforms, and particularly social mobile games, with the large footprint that OpenFaint was able to establish, uh, both within social gaming but also within casual gaming, um, and create a global platform, which we're releasing in the second quarter. Um, just to touch on the key points, it's, it's, we are focused very much so on social engagement, as well as being able to provide a set of tools that I think a lot of developers find familiar in uh, current platform offering, um, but very much customized around mobile environment itself. So um, that's, that's the context that I wanted to set. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have a Q&A around uh, a lot of these topics. There's uh, a lot to discuss in, in how platforms are developing and really how social gaming can evolve on mobile. Um, but uh, that's really what I had for today. Uh, so thank you guys very much for your time. Thanks for coming in this early after, uh, after your party last night that I missed. Uh, we're throwing a party tonight. If you guys can make it, please do. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll open up for a question and answer. So thank you very much, Ethan. That's fantastic stuff. Uh, we've had a few tweets in, but um, mostly commenting on uh, the insights you were bringing. Uh, before I go into those, are there any willing volunteers to ask us some questions? Anyone out there that's not too shy or not too hungover? Oh, no one's r immediately raising their hand, so I'm going to ask the first one. So one of the questions that um, I'm interested in, you mentioned virtual currency. Uh, this is something that's close to our hearts as well. Um, do you have any comments on the, sort of the differences between sort of the Apple model, which seems to be quite restrictive about that, versus the Android model, which seems to be a lot more open? Um, what do you think is, you know, is, is Apple blind? Is Apple got a good smart choice going on? Do you have any particular views on what they're doing and why? Um. So <clears throat> I ask that question a lot. I don't, I don't have a very good answer. My, my feeling is that uh, their terms of service was drafted, I think, uh, before they really understood a lot of the dynamics in social gaming. So my guess is that the terms of service that restricts a universal currency um, really wasn't directly intended to inhibit a universal currency. But I think that they are concerned about exchanging virtual goods between applications and the possible development of like secondary marketplaces uh, that could potentially erode their business. They really do need to protect in-app purchases. So I think what they're doing is they're applying these kinds of policies. They know that they can be overly restrictive. And I think that as sort of these different app, uh, like marketplaces or businesses shape up, they might adjust their terms of service accordingly. But it is inhibitive, and I think Android is, is better in that respect. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, a comment that was made uh, on, on Twitter, um, I'm trying to find out who, who said it. I'll try to work that out. Um, it, they were at Chart Boost, I think. Uh, there's someone from Chart Boost here, I believe. And they, they mentioned your comment on cross promotion and sort of benefit for that. Right. Um, how effective do you think that can actually be? Is it a trickle feed effect or is it something uh, which can have a kind of instant moment? My gut feeling is it's a trickle, it's a, a, a buffer thing. Uh so um, I think it, it's really uh, dangerous to just kind of give a general answer on that because cross-promotion can be executed poorly. Um, so uh, from what I understand, uh, Chartboost is actually very effective in, in uh, a lot of instances on doing this kind of cross-promotion. Uh, OpenFaint has seen a lot of success on cross-promotion, as has Gree. It has everything to do with how you do it. So if you're able to um, sort of uh, well-place cross-promotion uh, elements within a game, you're able to capture the audience at the right point during gameplay, then it actually can be very effective. And if you find the right games and you're able to identify the audiences within those games, then I think that works quite well. Uh, how you identify those audiences is a little difficult right now because, as I said earlier, there aren't really very sophisticated targeting technologies that are deployed across a vast user base. Um, Oftentimes, doing direct deals with another game developer that you know, where you have a clearer sense of their demo demography, those sorts of things, that's very effective. And then there are some targeting systems that are coming up. So uh, long answer uh, has everything to do with uh, execution and, and how to identify the audience. Short answer is, yeah, sure, it can be effective. Cool. Uh, do we have anyone feeling a little braver now? Is that a ham? No, that's no, just uh, moving. <laughs> Let's keep away. Any, any more for any more? 
Okay, guys. Well, um, you know, this is your this is your chance to talk to uh, you know, Gree, and obviously you've got me here as well. So if you have any social mobile questions, now is the perfect opportunity. Okay, so no one's biting. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Ethan very much for a great presentation, and uh, hopefully we'll have some have you all stay and talk more about the next session. So speak to you all soon.